I love the story of the Israelites and the exodus from Egypt. I remember as a child hearing about the manna from heaven. I don't know if the teacher said this or not, or if it was just my imagination, but I literally saw in my mind loaves of mini wonder bread falling from the sky. I don't know why, because we never had Wonder Bread in our home. It was always wheat bread. But I remember in school once a year where they would give us these mini loaves of Wonder Bread. And somehow I have associated it to this story ever since. Maybe it's the name. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Let's recap the story. The children of Israel have escaped the bondage of Egypt because the Lord has brought down upon the Egyptians the ten plagues. At the Red Sea, the Egyptians began pursuing the Israelites again, and the Lord divided the Red Sea, and the Israelites passed through on dry ground. When the Egyptians attempted to follow, they were swallowed up in the Red Sea. The Israelites came to Merah and began getting thirsty, as they were in a desert. The only water that they had was bitter. The Lord showed Moses a tree, and when they threw the tree in the water, it made it sweet and could be drunk. They continue on, and they then begin to get hungry. And they murmur again to Moses and Aaron. They complain that God took them out of Egypt where they could get unlimited bread and now they're going to die. Exodus 16.4 says, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I might prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. God tells them, quote, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quails came up and covered the camp. Sure enough, they had plenty of meat. The following morning, as the dew dried, laying on the ground was manna. But what was manna really? Exodus 16 verses 14 and 15 say, And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. First, the King James Bible describes it as similar to hoarfrost, This is hoarfrost. Pay particular attention to the sickle-like shape that it has. Other Bibles have other interpretations for this verse. The New American Standard Bible says, When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. The King James Bible describes it as small and round, and this is fine flake-like. It also appears that either way there was enough of it that it covered the ground to look like frost. So if you go to the Bible concordance on the small round thing, the Hebrew chaspas is more accurately translated as scale-like or flake-like, as it shows in the footnote in your Bible. The word small, the word dak in Hebrew means thin, small, or fine. So we could rewrite the verse to say, When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine, flaky, scale-like round thing, thin, small, and fine, as the frost on the ground. Well, that clears it up, right? No, but as I show you what manna was, this description starts to make a lot more sense. There is an indigenous tree found throughout the Middle East. It is drought-tolerant can flower from early spring to late fall, has deep roots to tap into deep groundwater, it provides wonderful shade, and it drinks an incredible amount of water compared to other trees. It is the tamarisk tree. It thrives in soils with high salt concentrations, such as those around the Red Sea, throughout the desert, up to the Dead Sea, which is the path the Israelites took through the desert. Due to its amazing tolerance to salty soil, it is the only type of tree found on the shores of the Dead Sea. There is a species of mealybug that is attracted to the tamarack tree, and it is found specifically in this region. It is the Tabutina manapara, commonly referred to as the manascale. It is called the manascale because of its association to this story of manna for the Israelites. The mealybug is like an aphid or other shell insect. These bugs only thrive during droughts. The manascale bug chews into the tree or leaves to get at the sweet sap. 
the tree drinks so much water that these little bugs get overwhelmed with sap. And the vast majority of it is excreted from their bodies, largely undigested, and falls to the ground. The tree also can drop sap directly from its branches where the bugs have created holes, but the majority goes through the mealy bug's body. From there, it gets shot out of them due to the force of the sap. Once it falls to the ground, it dries out and hardens into a flake-like substance, much of it thin, delicate, and round. Remember how the manna was described? When the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine, flaky, scale-like round thing, thin, small, and fine, as the frost on the ground. Yes, believe it or not, it is highly, highly likely that the manna from heaven was excreted tamarisk tree sap through these mealy bugs that would fall to the ground and be gathered up daily. Remember the hoarfrost reference? Makes more sense now, right? Maybe my idea of the Wonderloves weren't that far off. In 1929, a man by the name of Christian Gottfried Ehrenberg and another by the name of Hemprick thought that the manna was from drips of sap directly from the tree after the bugs left holes. However, later that year, F.S. Bodenheimer found that the manna was in fact produced by the insects themselves, to which they both said, ew. While we find this quite interesting, those in the Middle East have known the source of manna for thousands of years, and it is still a delicacy over there. It is well documented that the source of manna is through this process. The Israelites were commanded to gather it daily. They couldn't store it. It would go bad very, very quickly. If they didn't pick it up off the ground, it would be infested with maggots. It is interesting that the day before the Sabbath, there would be a double portion and they would be commanded to gather double the amount and then not gather on the Sabbath. Sometimes I wonder if our tradition of having large family dinners on the Sabbath goes against what God intends for our Sabbath worship. Perhaps we were supposed to use the leftovers from Saturday night for our Sunday meals. I love how the Lord attempts to teach the Israelites to rely on Him daily. In Numbers 11, 7-8, it says, And the manna was as coriander seed, and the color thereof was the color of delium. And the people went about and gathered it, and ground it in mills, and beat it in a mortar, and baked it in pans, and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. Do we truly rely on him every day as our bread of life? Or is what he gives us just a waste? Could we take this into our sacrament each week and gain a better understanding of that? By the way, if you're curious, the taste of manna is described in Exodus 16, where it says, And the house of Israel called the name therefore manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Today it is described much the same way as sweet, crunchy honeydew, and it is a great source of carbohydrates and other vitamins and minerals. One thing I like best about the story is that the Israelites don't seem to complain about it, at least initially. What I mean is that they don't complain about the source of the food. Moses said it was bread and they were thankful for it. With how much these guys complained about everything, I am shocked someone didn't say, uh, Moses, I have watched closely where this stuff comes from and uh, this isn't exactly from heaven. The Israelites were truly grateful and saw it being a blessing from God, which it was. Another lesson we could learn, the Lord always takes care of us if we are true and faithful, but it may not be in the way we want, hope, or expect. Let me pause here because each time I do a video like this, there's someone in the comments that says, so you're saying God didn't do this and it was all nature? How could you say that? I'm not saying that. Not at all. I firmly believe that God absolutely made this miracle possible, but we also know that God usually works with natural means to accomplish his goals and miracles. I think God prepared the environment, soil, tamarisk trees, and made it the bug's duty to be there right when the Israelites needed them. In fact, normally these bugs aren't in these trees year-round, and it is remarkable that there were enough trees and bugs to feed all of the Israelites year-round for nearly 40 years, through all their movements in the desert. There is nothing regular about this. It's truly a miracle from God. I mean, if we were to take Exodus 12 at its word, there would be about 2 million Israelites that came out of Egypt. 
Now, most scholars don't believe that this is the right number for a variety of reasons. Others believe that the number is closer to 30,000, but any number between 30,000 and 2 million is still a lot of people to live off of manna and quail for 40 years in a desert. Certainly a miracle from God. One of the most subtle but most profound lessons from the manna is from Numbers 11, when the children of Israel do complain about the manna. They aren't complaining about where it comes from, but that they were getting tired of it, and they liked and missed the food that they had in Egypt. They have the nerve to call that food from Egypt free food, including fish, cucumbers, and onions, although they only got it because they were in slavery. Here's the root of the Israelites' problem and why they had to wander for 40 years, and it has direct applicability to our lives today. The Israelites were in bondage in Egypt, but more than just physically, it was spiritually as well. The scriptures talk about the flesh pots of Egypt. The Israelites had become very sinful while in Egypt and accustomed to the sinful life that included many worldly pleasures, although technically in bondage as slaves. God saved them and took them into the desert. The desert was harsh and unforgiving, and there the Lord provided all that they needed. But the Israelites complained because life and freedom in the desert was less fun and had fewer worldly pleasures than being a slave in Egypt. Are we willing to give up slavery to sin even if it means less fun and fewer worldly pleasures? Perhaps even a very difficult life? That is the path of the Savior. The path of the Savior comes with endless benefits, but most of those, and certainly the best ones, will come in the next life and only after trials and difficulties here, which are designed to help us build faith, which is required for eternal progression. He gives you all you need, but your life may very well have fewer worldly pleasures when you follow Him. Are we willing to do that? Because many of the children of Israel weren't willing to do that then, and many of the children of Israel aren't willing to do that now. Many run back to their Egypt and into slavery and bondage of sin and addiction. What will you choose? In conclusion, what we can also learn from the story about the manna from heaven is that the Israelites needed to learn to rely on God as their number one, and they needed to rely on the mealybugs for their number two. I guess the other lesson we could take away from this is while we go through our own desert journey in this life, no matter how difficult, these things too shall pass. Thanks for watching.